Moses is not a Hebrew word or name at all. Moses is an Egyptian term. It means something. Uh, it's a secret symbol that means something. Uh, a classic example of what I tried to tell you on the past hour is that people are hearing stories about uh, religious figures that really do not understand what the real secret story really is. And so there's a exoteric uh, story and an esoteric story. Uh, exoteric is E-X. Exoteric means the story you read in the Bible. Just open up the Bible in Genesis and read it, and that's an exoteric story, meaning that's what everybody's going to see. Anybody open the Bible, just read it, and that's it. That's, you got it, and that's the story. But there's also something called an E-S an esoteric story, meaning a hidden story, an occult story. The word occult simply means hidden. So then you talk to the people who really know what the name of the tune is, the, the rabbis who have studied these ancient writings and know where they really came from and what they actually are talking about. And that's an esoteric story. Well, that's the kind of story you don't need to know nothing about. You just read the Bible and, and believe whatever it is you're told and everything's fine. And then one day you wake up when you're 90 years old in an old folks home and you find out everything you have believed in your life was a lie. Purposely designed to trick you into believing something that was not true at all. And so... Um, that's what I've been looking at for 59 years. All the stuff that is an esoteric story. I talk with the rabbis, the researchers, and writers, and, and inquire of the universities. And it's a really interesting story about how much you don't know. A classic example of what I'm talking about is we're told the story about Moses and the Ten Commandments. That story is so pregnant, like so many other stories about Moses, but the Ten Commandments story is so pregnant with extraordinary hidden symbols that really just will uh, knock you out when you begin to see what that story really came from and what it's actually talking about. It has nothing to do with anything you thought you understood about the Ten Commandments. First of all, there was no Ten Commandments at all, period. We now know, because if you go back and watch Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, we talked about this before, but I'll set it up by saying this, that in the movie, Indiana Jones is commissioned by the U.S. government to go out and find the Jewish Lost Ark of the Covenant. It had to do with the Ten Commandments in that time in the Jewish history, so-called. Well, Indiana Jones is supposedly the one man that if anyone could find the lost Ark of the Covenant, uh, it would be him. So the government sends him out to get the lost Ark and finds out that the Germans and the Nazis are looking for the lost Ark also. Well, there's a reason why. You will see the connection between the Nazi movement and the Jewish religion. Wow, what a story there is there. The Jewish religion in relation to the Nazi German, uh, Nazism in Germany. There's a big story there. But I'm not going to get into that. Let's stick with what we were talking about. So, Moses goes up into the mountain, uh, to Mount Sinai. But first of all, the, Mount Sinai is, is named after a moon god. In Arabia, thousands of years ago, there was a moon god. Today, his name is Allah. Today, we call Allah uh, as, a, as an Arabic name for God. And that god, Allah, was well known for a thousand years, even before Islam developed, before uh, Muhammad ever lived. There was already the worship of Allah. And we know that Allah was a moon god. And so, uh, but so when Moses goes up, we find that he's going up into the mountain called Mount Sinai, which in point of fact, the encyclopedias will tell you 
that the moon god that we today refer to as Allah is the same moon god that the Jews call Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, Yahweh. Yahweh is Allah. Allah is Arabic. Yahweh is Hebrew. It's the same God. And so therefore Moses was the leader or the, or the namesake. He wasn't a leader because Moses never lived. There was no such a man named Moses who ever lived. It's part of the story, the Arabic story from thousands of years ago, the Arabic story of the worship of the moon god. Well, and the let, moon me, god, let me break in here for, for a good reason. Yep. Uh, the moon god. So there's this god, there's that god, and what you're saying is that they are the same god, this particular moon god, which, again, if you look at the Islamic symbols today, you'll see there, there's a crescent moon. Okay. Yep. But here's the fascinating thing. Moses is credited generally in the mainstream sense as being one of the first people to talk about. I mean, obviously, Abraham allegedly was talking to uh, the one true God. But let's put Abraham aside because he's a whole other subject. Moses is allegedly going up to the mountain to speak to the one true God. Mm-hmm. Now, this monotheism that is being represented here sounds, again, an awful lot like, and I mentioned this in the first hour, sounds an awful lot like what the Pharaoh Akhenaten did, (laughs) where it came down to, there's only one God, forget all these other gods. And there were many gods at this particular point in history, and throughout history, there were many gods that were uh, worshipped, represented, that, that allegedly visited, that had stories about them. All of them seemed to converge, but see, it's interesting here that the one true God gives his laws to Moses according to the story and what does he do it with with a burning bush <laughs> and on this yeah. mountain so you're tell, you you told us about the mountain and how Sinai is you know it, it, that's interesting but the idea that this is the one god as opposed to just this particular moon god which anybody who knew about the moon god would say that he wasn't the only god right uh, yeah. But that he was a god. Now this right, is. Look at, we're told that the Jews were the original monotheistic religion. They right. were the original people who had the idea of only one true God. Well, in point of fact, that is just a story that has no legitimacy and no factual history to that at all. History, if you go to any good library. Uh, and look up the history of the Jewish people, you will see that the Jewish people were uh, anything but monotheistic. They were worshippers of many gods. They have, And today, Judaism is a combination of at least seven different ancient uh, religious institutions of the ancient world that have been molded into one religion. Today is called... Judaism, but Judaism is actually seven different ancient religions that have been amalgamated into one. And so today, uh, part of the one seventh of the Jewish religion is the worship of the planet uh, uh, Saturn. Saturn is a very important god now to the Jews of today. Uh, the moon god, the moon god. Uh, is very important to the the Jewish religion today. Even the Jews admit that they have a lunar calendar, not a solar, but a lunar calendar. And why do they have their holy days after sunset, always after sundown? Their day begins at 6 o'clock in the evening to 6 o'clock the next evening. That is a fact. Why why do the Jews have a 6 o'clock... in the evening starts their day. That's when the moon comes out at six o'clock. So they are a moon worshiping cult. And right. therefore the ancient, if you go back to encyclopedias and look up the word S-I-N, sin, it's not the falling short like the Catholic Church says, is that when you fall short and you've done something wrong, it's a sin. No, look up the word sin, S-I-N. It will tell you in a dictionary, Sin was the name of the moon god of Arabia. 
Today we refer to him today as Allah. But no, originally Allah's name was S-I-N, the moon god. And the ancient world, in the ancient uh, uh, Arabic world, from Egypt and from the West Sinai, you look eastward every evening at 6 o'clock. And there's a huge and high mountain range in Sinai. And so from Egypt side and from the western Sinai, looking back east, every evening at 6 o'clock, the moon came out of the mountain. So they were looking for the moon god, and every evening he popped out of the mountain. So the Arabs called the moon god Sin, S-I-N. And he became known as the old man of the mountain. We've heard that term in religion, the old man of the mountain. And so Sin was obviously a moon god. S-I-N was his name and A-I was a mountain in the ancient Arabic. And so A-I is a mountain and the god of that mountain is called Sin. So you put it together, it becomes Sinai. No, Sin AI, the mountain of the moon god, Sin. Right. Now, because, because you, uh, uh, talked about Saturn also being a part of the. Well, yeah, but I got five more. You know, we could go back to five more different gods, but I'm just making the point about Mount Sinai. Right. It's so holy. It's not holy. It's a, ho- it's a mountain in which the people of Egypt and the western Sinai would look eastward at 6 o'clock in the evening and they would see the moon rise from the mountain. So the ancient uh, Arabic world believed that the moon was a god. And so, but he obviously, uh, it doesn't take a genius to realize, the moon lived in the mountain. Why? Because it's where he comes up from. Every, every evening at 6 o'clock, you see him waking up to start a new day, so the new day begins at 6 in the evening, and that's the way it works today, that the Jews count their days from 6 in the evening to 6 in the evening. Why? Because that's when the moon god Sin rose from the mountain, so he starts his day at 6 in the evening. So did the Jew. They have a lunar calendar based on the moon. So, once you understand that lunar worship Moses was nearly a word that is used in relation to the lunar religion of the ancient Arabic world. There, in point of actual fact, was no Moses. Moses never lived. But it's like telling the story about Jesus and telling the story about Buddha or telling the story about some other religious figure that actually, in fact, never existed. So you have to have a focal point for that religion where the focal point was Moses then you understand Moses was not an actual uh, person who really lived but Moses was a name of a of a a leader of the lunar cult and so he went up into uh, the mountain of Mount Sinai and the scripture says and all the reference works say will tell you that Mount Sinai where Moses went up was was on fire. It was a frightening experience for the Israelites. They were told to not go near that mountain. It was very very frightening for the for the story goes, because it was it was uh, it was exploding. There was fire and, and and smoke coming from the mountain. And the Bible says in the book of Job and in the Old Testament it talks about when Moses went up into the mountain to see Jehovah and Yahweh. Uh, it was a very frightening experience because the mountain was on fire with smoke and, and, and lightning going. And so, well, all, all you have to do is, is have enough brains to understand a mountain that's on fire and bellowing smoke and fire is a volcano. He went up into a volcano. And so then you find out, well, wait a minute. The, the Midianites and the ancient Midianites of which Moses was supposedly one, or a married one, was a Midianite, and the Midianites worshipped a goddess, a goddess who was a volcano. And today we still have volcanoes around the world with women's names. In Hawaii, there's a, a very big volcano. It's got a woman's name. Why? Because volcanoes were understood to be symbolically a woman during sex. 
It's a hole that's burning with fire. And so she is blowing apart uh, in sexual, uh, you know, sexual uh, ecstasy. It's a volcano. And so the whole system of, of religion based on sex in the volcano. Look in the, look in the dictionary on the volcano worship. And it will tell you all the, the many different volcanoes which symbolize sex of a female. And so now you go back to the story of Moses going up into the volcano, which is a symbol for female sexual release. And then, uh, he talks with, uh, uh, he talks with God. And when he comes down from Mount Sinai, Sin, Ai, Sin, Ai, the mountain of the god Sin, uh, he has ten commandments. Well, I point the fact there was no ten commandments, period. Uh, and this is why I told you that Indiana Jones goes to uh, find the lost Ark of the Covenant. Where does he go first? Well, Indiana Jones is a lot of things, but stupid is not one of them. So where does he go to find the, the, the holy Ark of the Covenant, the Jewish Ark of the Covenant? He goes to Tibet and to northern India and to Tibet first, because that's where you need to go. Spielberg knew that, so he put that in the movie. And so from Tibet, <coughs> excuse me, from Tibet, Spielberg has Indiana Jones going to what? The Holy Land? Uh, Israel, God's chosen people and, and God, God's chosen land and the Holy Land? No. Indiana Jones goes to Egypt and he finds the lost ark in Egypt in a tomb in Egypt. Spielberg is a lot of things, but stupid isn't one of them. And he knows exactly what that story really came from. And that's why I like watching Spielberg's movies, because I know what he's doing. He's telling you something, but you're being entertained and you don't see it. So Indiana Jones finds the, the lost Ark of the Covenant in Egypt. Why? Because it never was a Jewish Ark to start with. All the encyclopedias, the Britannica, Americana, the Jewish Encyclopedia... The Catholic Encyclopedia, just do some research on the lost Ark of the Covenant, and it will tell you there was no Ark of the Covenant. It never existed. It's a story that came out of the ancient Arabic world that had to do with Egypt. <clears throat> and it was an Egyptian Ark. And if you go on my website, the jordanmaxwellshow.com, and join my research society. It takes something to do it. Join my research society. One of the first things you will see is all the history of religions, all the symbols and words of religion that you never knew, you've never been told. <clears throat> and it's right there that you will see what I'm talking about. Almost all the things that I will talk about in this program are already on my research society. So... You want the pictures? Go join the research society on my website, Jordan Maxwell Show. Now, when you see that uh, Indiana Jones finds a lost Ark of the Covenant in Egypt, <clears throat> it's because there was no lost Ark of the Hebrews, period. It's just a story. The Bible is referred to as the greatest story ever told. It's not the greatest collection of historical facts ever assembled. The greatest story ever told. I used to get in trouble as a little kid. My mom would say, are you telling us a story? Meaning, are you fabricating a lie? It's just a story. Well, that's what the Bible is called. The greatest story ever told. Why? Is because the stories in the Bible have been told hundreds of times before. And they are, and, and so it's just a retelling now, in the so-called Hebrew tradition, a retelling of stories that were around 5,000 years before the Jewish people ever existed. And they just today are taking from Hollywood, and we know what's going on in Hollywood. And they take stories from the old ancient Sumerians, Babylonians, Akkadians, the Hittites, uh, especially the Canaanite peoples of the ancient, uh, ancient East, 
and they reworked them into stories and called it Hebrew. And point of fact, there was no Moses, there was no Ten Commandments, there was no Jewish Ark of the Covenant, there was an Egyptian Ark of the Contract, Egyptian Ark of the Contract, not Jewish Ark of the Covenant. So there was no Jewish Ark of the Covenant. So that's why you don't have to worry, worry about going out and researching and trying to find the lost Ark of the Covenant. And we know it's out there somewhere in the Middle East. It's being hidden in the Middle East. No, it's not being hidden in the Middle East. It never existed to start with. It's just a story that has no basis in actual fact at all. And then if you look at the Bible, Old Testament is where you find out about the Ark of the Covenant. We'll go to the New Testament and go to the book of Revelation. The last book in the New Testament and in the book of Revelation, it says God took the the Ark of the Covenant uh, and took it into heaven. And so in heaven, there is now an Ark of the Covenant, the Bible says, in heaven. So when you get these poor people, ill-informed, unread, uh, ignorant, ill-informed people who believe that there is a, a divine Ark of the Covenant and they're still looking for it today. And we're told that all the Ethiopians have it. It's all, that's where it is. The Ark of the Covenant is in Ethiopia. And, and but, well, can we go see it? No, 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 you can't see it. Because the Ethiopians say it's so holy that we can't show it to you. Oh, really? That's like the scientists and astronomers today telling me that there's a black hole out there. I ask, have you ever brought back a piece of a black hole for me to see? No, no. You can't see it because it's black and it's a hole. Oh, okay. So therefore, I believe that there's a black hole out there. Why? Because you told me. And But you can't show it to me because it's black and it's a hole. Yeah, well, how convenient. No, I begin to see that this is all a story, the whole thing. Now, when Moses uh, goes up into the mountain, the mountain is on fire. It's a volcano, obviously, because the scripture said that God was with Moses and the, in the, in the Hebrew and the ancient Israelite people. And how did they know that? Because it said the, the mountain was on fire at night in a pillar of cloud by day. Well, that's what a volcano is. I don't know if you've ever noticed that, but volcanoes are a pillar of fire by day and a pillar of, of cloud by night. Oh, all you so have to Moses do is look is at a uh, recent video from Hawaii, and you can see exactly what happens uh, when a volcano just yeah. begins to uh, stir. And yes, indeed, uh, the glowing red hot stuff is there, but then uh, the the soot, the smoke, all of it, the debris in the air itself uh, literally creates a dark cloud around the uh, the actual place. I mean, this is just the physical reality. It's a perfect description for a That's volcano. Exactly right. right. But go read the Bible, and when it says that Moses went up to the mountain it was on fire and all the Israelites and all the poor people uh, watching Moses go up on the mountain it says that frightened them they were frightened to death and they, they wanted to get away from there because it was a, it was a violent uh, eruption on the mountain and they said God is there he's really angry and he's, uh, he's erupting and he's really mad he's really angry and Moses, you have to go up and, and quiet him down and, and make some kind of a peaceful you know, arrangement with him because he's just burning mad. And in, the, and in daytime, uh, he's, a, he's a cloud by day and a fire by night. So we now know that Mount Sinai, we're talking about volcano worship, which, which, uh, which is actually goes back to the ancient old Phoenician Canaanites and the Hittites who had the volcano as a goddess, symbol for the goddess, because she's erupting and, and, and violent, and that's where we got something called the, uh, well, the Ten Commandments. Now, the Ten Commandments were actually based on the 12 negative confessions. Go to a library and read a book about the 12 negative confessions. Because there were 12 uh, laws of negative confessions that the Egyptians had. And they called it the 12 negative confessions because the Ten Commandments said, Thou shalt not do this and thou shalt not do that. But the negative confessions of the Egyptians said, I will not do. 
I will not do this. I will not have strange gods before me. <clears throat> I will not covet my neighbor's wife and his goods. I will not lie against my brother. I will not do this. I will not do that. But the but the Ten Commandments said, Thou shall not do this. And so that's where you get the Ten Commandments. It's from the Egyptian Twelve Negative Confessions. Go do some research and you'll find there was no Ten Commandments. That's why Indiana Jones finds a lost ark in Egypt. It's an Egyptian story from start to finish. But Moses then goes up into the mountain and he comes back with these Ten Commandments. Now, in the movie, uh, you remember that that, um, that Charlton Heston comes down from the mountain. And he's got these two big slab stones, and on it is, is written, by the hand of God, is written the, the Ten Commandments on these stone tablets. Well, actually, there wasn't no stone tablets at all. It's just a story. If you go back to the encyclopedias on religion and ethics, encyclopedias of religious symbols, etc., you will find that the Jews today call the Ten Commandments, not the stones, of, uh, you know, they're, they're talking about uh, rock and stone. The Ten Commandments are referred to today as the stones of the testimony. The stones of the testimony. And there had to be two stones of the testimony, one in each hand. But no, the actual reference book will tell you that the stones of the testimony were two round, small stones that you could carry in one hand. And so these two round stones had the Ten Commandments written on one all the way around the circle, or the Ten Commandments written on the one stone, and according to uh, the, 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 the religious uh, philosophers and teachers, they say that the second uh, round stone was identical to the first. So there were two witnesses. God had two stones saying the same thing. So he had two witnesses, because in Hebrew and Jewish religion, two witnesses are important. And so you have two witnesses, are, which is actually small round stones that can be carried in one hand. And they were called the stones of the testimony. This is why when you are in school, you're going to take a test. Or you're going to a court, you're going to testify. Or testimonial. Testify comes from testes. That's where it comes from. Look in the encyclopedia. Dictionary will tell you testes, the two round stones. They are called the, the stones of the testimony, the testicles. And that's why in the ancient Egyptian and even in the Hebrew, uh, I don't know if it's practiced today, but in the ancient world we're told that if one Jew brings another Jew into the Jewish court, you are bringing your brother Jew into court and you are now at war with him. Because there's going to be a trial. Somebody's going to jail or somebody's going to pay. And so in order for you as a Jew going before the Jewish high court uh, to, to testify against your brother, you were required to hold your testicles in your hand as you make your speech and as you testify. Why? Because the symbol is obvious. If we catch you lying, against your brother in this court, you know what's going to happen to you because you're holding your testicles. And so today we even have you know, people saying the same thing. When you go into court, they got you. They got you by the balls. Yeah, the two round stones of the testimony. So there wasn't big plates of, 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 of rock. It was just two round small stones carried at one hand and they were called stones of the testimony. Well, interesting so to know, too, that when you sign your marriage contract, uh, which is a contract also, as some people refer to it as the covenant of marriage, but right. uh, in reality, you, you require two witnesses, don't you? That's right. Okay. <laughs> Just wanted to show that parallel. Go ahead. Yeah, and you do have two witnesses. Yeah, hanging between your legs, two witnesses, the it, testa. That, too. Testimony. <laughs> but That's anyway, right. Please continue. So, therefore, that's the name of the tomb for the Ten Commandments. There was no Ten Commandments. There were twelve negative confessions. But the Ten Commandments were not big stones. It was just two round, small stones. And they were called the, the stones of the testa. 
and test that comes from testes. So, you know, take that and two bucks and get you a cup of coffee. But that's what I'm talking about. There's so much you didn't know about the stories of Moses. Now, Moses goes up into, uh, and up into the mountain that's on fire and he, uh, he confronts the Almighty God and something called the, uh, the, uh, burning bush. Well, if you, rem- if, if today watch on television and when there's news stories on TV at news at night, you will see the Jews in Jerusalem in Jerusalem and they are praying at the wailing wall they're praying at the wall uh, and so but watch the Jews as they're praying at the wall they're bobbing back and forth up and down bob, back and forth they're bobbing have you ever seen that sure absolutely okay do you know what that symbolizes it symbolizes they're having sex with God they're bobbing back and forth, having sex. It's a sexual symbol. And they're having sex with something called the she kinda, not he kinda, she kinda. And so the she kinda is the female part of God, because the scripture says in Genesis that God created man, uh, man and woman, male and female, he created them. So logic alone would tell you that God must be male and female. He's a homophonite God. He's both male and female. So then he divides himself as he does with all animals, all animals. There's a male side and the female side. And so now that's why the Jews are bobbing back and forth because they're having sex with the she kind of. Because that's what it's spelled, S-H-E, she kind of, is the feminine part of God, uh, feminine sex with God. So therefore, today we got Jews out there um, bobbing back and forth, having sex with God. And uh, and so the burning bush, uh, when you go back to the encyclopedias, I'll look up the word burning bush and begin to see where the burning bush was simply a term that came out of the ancient Arabic world for the female uh, during sex. So it's a sexual symbol for the female, the burning bush. And so when you start to look at these words in terms and find out what they're really talking about, it doesn't have anything to do with the holiness of holies that you know about. It's talking about sex, alcohol, drugs, power, money. The whole thing is an incredible uh, story. Another wonderful story about Moses when he's up on the mountain, the volcano, which symbolizes a female in sex. But he's up on that, uh, uh, on the, on the mountain, and it says Moses asked God if he could see him. He wanted to actually see God. And the scripture says that God said, no, Moses, uh, you know, I appreciate everything you've done. You're, you're a faithful follower, but, uh, no man can see me and live. So if I show you what I look like, I'll have to kill you. So no man can see me and live. And then it says, but then God said, he added something, an addendum to that. God says, well, first of all, you've been so holy and righteous, Moses, and you've been so faithful that I think I'll make a, a special case for you. Normally, no man can see me and live. But I'll tell you what I'm going to do for you. Only because you are so holy and righteous. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to do something for you. And it's going to be wonderful. I'm going to show you, the scripture says, I'm going to show you my glory. The most glorious part of my presence in this universe. I'm going to show it to you. And, uh, and so he said, so Moses, uh, is now excited. God has allowed him to see God's glory. So God says to Moses, now you see that big rock over there, those big rocks over there? Yeah. Go over behind those rocks and hide yourself. This is what the scripture says. Go over, God says to Moses, go over there and hide yourself. And I'm going to pull my pants down and my drawers down and I'm going to show you my ass. And so when I give you the high side, you peep out and you can see my butt. 
And that will be wonderful. That's my glory to see my ass. And so, and then you can go back and tell all the Israelites that you saw God pulling his pants down and you saw his butt. And that's his glory. And so, that's what the scripture says. Moses popped out from behind the, the rocks when God called him and he could see God's butt. And so, I don't know what that tells you. No, I would add to that, yeah, that and two bucks will get you a cup of coffee. You know, I was going to so, say, I, I, I'm not sure what to take from that. <laughs> um, you know, uh, what 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 is it that you take from that? I'm 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 unsure, except that it seems to be strange behavior. For yeah, but it's in the Vatican. Have you seen the Sistine Chapel where God is reaching out to touch Adam? Or well, just yeah. above that is a picture of God bending over, showing his butt. That's you, in the Sistine Chapel. You know, I've never noticed it, but I, I bet you I can find a, uh, an image of oh, that. I bet you could. Just go just go, and God in, uh, touching Adam. And you know the man reclining, and he's reaching out to touch God. And God is reaching out to touch him. And their two fingers are almost touching. We're just above that. Just go on the web and type in God showing his ass. God showing his butt. And you will see a beautiful painting on the Sistine Chapel ceiling of God bending over and Moses looking at his butt. I didn't paint it. I'm just telling you, it's there. No, I, I, I believe you, Jordan. And believe it or not, we, we've almost come to the end of the second hour. Uh, but it's it's just objectively, I'm sitting here and saying to myself. <laughs> right. Yeah, well... Look at Moses was was up there seeing the moon god, uh, uh, you know, Yahweh, the moon god. But the moon god is showing his ass. He's showing uh, Moses his butt. Okay, and that's on the Sistine Chapel ceiling. So today we have young kids today who will drive by and they pull their pants down, stick their butt out the window, and they call it mooning you, mooning you. Why? Because the moon god Yahweh moon Moses he's the moon god he bent over and showed his glory which was his big ass and he showed his, the moon to Moses because he's the moon god mooning Moses and that's what we call it today kids will pull their pants down and drive by and stick their butt out the window and it's called mooning you I see and there's even phrases uh, popular phrases in a couple of different languages that basically translate in English to uh to showing your ass of uh, course absolutely and and literally that i i never never considered this um but just like take a step back for a second though jordan and just you know let's kind of finish on this note tonight because this to me is is a bizarre piece of the story uh if i were to take this entire narrative seriously right and you're climbing up on a allegedly sacred mountain. Of course, you covered that, but let's just let's just go with the face value for a second. You're a leader of a people. You've climbed up a sacred mountain, and yeah. uh, you are you are going there to commune with your yeah. God, who is the one God according to the fable. Yeah, yeah. Um, and what he does is show you his ass. Um, <laughs> he shows you his butt. I, I'm just, I, I'm, I'm dumbfounded by yeah, that. So you can go idea. home now and tell all the Jewish people, the followers, that you saw God showing His ass up there. He was, yep, God's out there showing His ass again. <laughs> I mean, that's just. I mean, it sounds comical, but it's actually what's there, isn't it? Of course, read it and go read it. And He was healing, and Moses was healing people with this, with this uh, magic wand. And the moon god Sin lived in the mountain. Every night came up, woke up at 6 o'clock. So therefore the Jews still have their holy days after 6 o'clock. They have the days after 6 o'clock. This is why we have the Ten Commandments. No, two small round stones called the stones of the testimony. Two testicles. It's a wonderful, wonderful, incredible, dark secret of the Jewish religion that nobody seems to know anything about. But it's all there if you just go to Encyclopedia and look it up. It's all there. 
Well, the other, the other interesting part of this is throughout most of these discussions, and again, we are getting close to the end here, but throughout most of these discussions, you know, one, what, one of the biggest overall themes is here in the three major religions, uh, is sex. Sex yeah. and, uh, you know. Well, the bottom line on the earth is sex. That is the bottom line on the earth for mankind is sex. Period. It's the most powerful seagull uh, directive on the human planet. The earth is sex. You don't think so? Look around. The Arabs and the Ara- Arabic religion of Islam. Right. Uh, uh, adults can marry a child, six years old girl. They can marry a five year old. And if you, and, and, and they can, uh, um, they can take the five year old home as a wife, a four, five, six year old child. And, and of course in the, in the Jewish Talmud, all you gotta do is go to a library, get the Talmud, the Babylonian, the, or the, the Babylonian Talmud and read the Jewish Babylonian Talmud. Talked about how it's perfectly alright for a grown man to have sex and sleep with a six year old boy. Or, or a five-year-old girl, there's nothing wrong with that at all. It's all part of the ancient tradition of adults having sex with children. And that's in the Talmud. It's all there. All you got to do is just go on the web and type in sex with children in the Babylonian Talmud. It gives you all the scriptures in the Talmud where the ancient rabbi has said there's nothing to it. You marry a little six-year-old and take her back as a wife. And, uh, and if she dies from the rape, well, that's too bad, but there's another six-year-old out there you can... So we know that the Jews were, were into uh, child uh, sex and child stuff. We, we know all of that. We, today we call it pornography. No, it's just child sex. Right, and then and, the and Catholics... We know, we know that Islam, uh, that, that, uh, that, that um, yeah. the Islamic religion has, uh, you know, child marriages where... And, and the one thing about the, the Islamic religion, Muhammad, uh, that religion says that you cannot have sex with a child unless you're married. You have to be properly married. Well, oh, that's, that's nice. So how do you do that? Well, there is, in Islam today, there is a, there is a law that says that you can rent a, 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 a little kid uh, for the night. And so it's a, it's a one 24 hour, 24 hour marriage. There's a word for it in, in the Islamic world. I forgot the word, but it's a word for it, which means if you're an Islamic follower today, you can, if you see some little kid that you like, so you can go to the parent and say, I want to marry her, but just for tonight, just for tonight. So the parents will give you a price, whatever the price is. And then there will be a small, quickie little ceremony, <laughs> like we do in Vegas, a little quickie ceremony where you are married for 24 hours. You bring her back 24 hours from now, but you can live with her tonight like you're married. And she's only eight years old. She's only seven years old. doesn't matter. And so you can rent her for the night. It's called a marriage, but you have to pay for it. Mm. And, just, and so, just to be fair to the three major religions, though, we also had to cover where the nuns come from, right. and they're not always, uh, as as somebody stated, you know, the twelve year old, uh, uh, you know, age of consent there in the Vatican. Um, right. I'm very sure that there were much younger nuns at various points. I mean, today we're we're faced with the scandals, you know, the alleged scandals that come from the Catholic Church and uh, mm-hmm. the uh, the abuse of boys. But then again, in a lot of cases, they're altar boys and they're men to be on the altar anyway That's so right. uh you know but but my point is you know e- even outside of e- if you remove all of this uh horrendous i mean let's just call it what it is a, a pedophilia if yeah. you remove all that it's still all about sex even even when you get rid of these you know uh, horrible the things part of it but it's still the basic fundamental principles of mankind men and women Mm. Sex, boys and girls. Well, see now, old you, men, young girls, right? Older women, young boys. It's still the bottom line is only God can create life. Well, that's what the man does, creates life. 